Plans for radical reform of the welfare system are unveiled by the government. Benefit payments will be replaced by a single universal credit under proposals aimed at getting more people back into work. Calls for excessive health and safety rules to be abolished. Countdown to the Commonwealth Games. Prince Charles arrives in Delhi ahead of tomorrow's opening ceremony. And Europe fight back in the Ryder Cup at Celtic Manor to leave the competition finely balanced. Hello and good evening. Plans for the most radical overhaul of the welfare system in decades have been unveiled by the government. Under the proposals, individual benefit payments will be replaced by a new universal credit. A key aim is to ensure that anyone in work will be better off than someone on the dole. But critics say it risks making some of the most vulnerable in society worse off. Our political correspondent Carol Walker has the details and her report does contain some flash photography from the start. It's his first conference as Prime Minister. David Cameron will be hoping the announcement of radical welfare reform will show the coalition is not just out to slash public spending. The government wants to encourage people like Joanne to work. She's a single parent living on benefits and has three children. Taking a job would mean less time with her children and not much more money. What's stopping me at the moment is like money. Because at the moment, I've got to find a job that's going to cover all costs, rent, council tax, everything what I'm going to lose, like school dinners, um, bus fares. It's a lot I've got to cover. And when I worked it out on minimum wage, I'd just come out with £40 extra. Ian Duncan-Smith has been on a mission to find ways of breaking the cycle of poverty and unemployment since he visited the Easter House estate in Glasgow eight years ago. Now, as Work and Pension Secretary, he's won agreement for far-reaching reforms to simplify the benefit system and make sure people are better off in work. A whole range of separate benefits, the housing, families with children and the unemployed, will merge into one universal credit. The government says that when people find work and their salaries go up, their benefits will be withdrawn gradually. More details will be spelt out here at the Conservative Party conference this week. A spokeswoman told me there would be no losers, but a shake-up on this scale is difficult to get right. Most people receiving out-of-work benefits are by definition in the bottom half of the income distribution. So if they have their benefits reduced or taken away and they don't respond by moving into work, they will be poorer, worse off, and clearly the gap between their incomes and the incomes of those who are in work would widen. That will be a real concern back on the Easter House estate, where many are still dependent on benefits and jobs are hard to find. Improving the lives of people here will be the real test of the government's reforms. And Carol is outside the conference now. Uh, so how significant are these proposals? Well, David Cameron has, has described them as revolutionary and certainly they are very ambitious, but it will take quite some time before these plans are fully in place, perhaps as long as 10 years. And it's worth bearing in mind that if you're going to allow more people to keep more benefits, in the short term there is a cost, and that cost is going to have to be found by Ian Duncan Smith from the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, we don't have many of the figures on this yet. Uh, we also know that Ian Duncan Smith still, Smith still hasn't agreed the overall budget for his department. So an awful lot to be worked out so far before we can really judge whether these plans are going to work. OK, Carol, thank you. The United States is expected to issue a new terrorist alert for Americans in Europe tomorrow following intelligence about the possible threat of an al-Qaeda attack. It's understood the advice from the State Department will urge US citizens to stay vigilant but doesn't identify any specific targets or countries. Police in Northern Ireland are investigating the deaths of an estranged couple whose bodies were found in County Antrim this morning. Sharon Hull was found dead in her home shortly before the body of her husband Philip was discovered in a car a few miles away. Chris Page reports. This is Philip and Sharon Hull before their separation. A sociable couple with three young children 
they were well known in the community. Now it appears that early this morning, Mr Hull murdered his wife, then took his own life. Sharon Hull, who was 32, was stabbed to death at her home. She was found by her mother, who raised the alarm. Ten minutes later, Philip Hull was found dead in a car at a forest a few miles outside the town. He was 34. All day, police have been searching for clues, trying to find out what happened in the hours before Sharon and Philip Hull's deaths. Neighbours living in this quiet cul-de-sac say above all they're saddened for the couple's three children. They were not at the house when Sharon Hull was killed, but neighbours say they were there yesterday. It's a, a great uh, shock for them, great shock for the entire family, but everyone now is you know, so uh, thoughtful of, of what, where these young children, what happens to them now. Tonight, police have confirmed they're not looking to speak to anyone else about the deaths. But they're still investigating the tragic sequence of events which ended in Sharon Hull's murder and Philip Hull's suicide. Chris Page, BBC News, Antrim. Barclaycard has apologised for a technical fault which meant shoppers could not make any card payments in some large retailers this afternoon. Hundreds of Sainsbury stores were affected by the problem, as well as Waitrose, B&Q, Homebase and Argos. Excessive health and safety rules in England and Wales should be abolished, according to an influential government advisor. The Conservative peer, Lord Young, says people are misusing the law to ban anything from pancake day races to letting children play with conkers. Bernando reports. <laughs> Autumn, the season of mists, mellow fruitfulness and conkers. Ow. But is conker fighting really so dangerous? Children need to wear goggles? Got it! <laughs> How would you feel about wearing these to play conkers? I would feel a bit silly. But it's actually an urban myth that the health and safety executive ever suggested children should wear goggles or even hard hats to play conkers. In fact, that was a decision taken individually by a lone head teacher, then followed by others. And the problem is often not the health and safety rules, but the fact that they're overzealously implemented by local government officials or teachers. Cheese rolling, pancake tossing, even flag flying are just some of the activities that have fallen foul of misguided Jobsworths. Now, Conservative peer Lord Young has carried out a review aimed at restoring common sense to health and safety. It's not the business of the local authority to tell you or me how to behave. If I want to do something stupid and risk breaking my leg, that's up to me. It's my life. Among other ideas, Lord Young says local councils should pay compensation if they wrongly block events. There should be a crackdown on no-win, no-fee lawyers and restrictions on advertising, and better guidelines so people aren't sued for accidents during voluntary work or events. But lawyers' groups say health and safety works. We are in fact seeing less claims, we're seeing less people injured, and that has to be a good thing. So we'd be very concerned about any steps that would be taken to reduce um, the, the, the law in this area that might lead to people being more injured. In the 60s, children played with concrete pipes. Much has changed since then, and some are urging Lord Young not to turn the clock back too far. Ben Ando, BBC News. Prince Charles has arrived in India ahead of the official opening of the Commonwealth Games tomorrow. The build-up to the event has been marred with controversy over the standards of some of the athletes' accommodation and security fears. From Delhi, James Pearce sent this report. The Prince of Wales and the President of India. Between them, they'll have the task of opening the Games tomorrow evening. As they stroll through the garden, both would have been well aware that the reputation of India's ability to host major events is now at stake. <laughs> Meanwhile, many of the competitors have been enjoying some pre-games hospitality courtesy of the British High Commission. An appropriate choice of song, perhaps, considering the problems that have dogged the build-up to these games. But the athletes have decided to come here appear to be up for the challenge. This has been the competition I've been focusing on. Uh, retirement is planned around this, and I've had no doubts whatsoever that I was going to be coming out here to perform. At the swimming pool, there's still work taking place. Equipment's being installed underwater. The synchronised swimmers continue their practice session unperturbed. But even as a flag bearers rehearse their medal ceremonies, there's a feel of a last-minute rush about the place. 
this venue, like most of the others, looks good, but problems continue behind the scenes. For example, in here at the moment, it's really hot. The reason? I'm told that the air conditioning operators have switched off the system because they haven't been fed. The organisers have released these pictures of rehearsals for the opening ceremony. There'll be relief throughout India that the Games are finally getting underway, with the hope that if tomorrow goes well, then some of the problems could be forgotten. James Pierce, BBC News, Delhi. Now, with the rest of the day's sport, here's Ollie Foster. Hello. Hello, Riz. Thank you very much indeed. Hello there. There was a hectic Ryder Cup schedule today as all 24 golfers took to the course. America lead Europe by six points to four going into what should be the final day of competition. But as Andy Swiss reports from Celtic Manor, there are still six matches that have to be completed and Europe have the lead in all of them. Celtic Manor has its fair share of water features, but this morning there were a few unwanted ones. The aftermath of yesterday's deluge in very squelchy evidence. But the fans simply didn't care. They soon had even more to celebrate. Rory McIlroy setting the tone in spine-tingling style. Go! Oh, what a putt from young Rory. It was classic Ryder Cup theatre. After a strong European start, the nerves began to fray. Back and forth, the momentum swung. Steve Stricker inspired as America took a narrow lead. But come the afternoon, the hosts battled back. Luke Donald with perhaps the shot of the day. Oh, fabulous goal shot from Luke Donald. Yet again, though, their opponents edged it. Stuart Sink's nerveless putt sparking American euphoria. The USA were 6-4 ahead. Europe, it seemed, were wobbling. But then, a stirring late fight back. Eduardo and Francesco Molinari with a little brotherly love. And by the close, Europe led in all six matches out on the course. A thrilling end to a frantic day. Beautiful putt there. After playing catch up with the schedule, organisers say we could still get a finish here tomorrow, but more heavy rain is forecast. For both the players and the officials, a nerve wracking Sunday is guaranteed. Andy Swiss, BBC News, Celtic Manor. Wigan have won the Super League Grand Final for the first time in 12 years. They beat their great rivals St Helens by 22 points to 10 at Old Trafford, as Joe Wilson reports. In golf, continents clash. In rugby league, a rivalry between teams just 10 miles apart. Wigan versus St Helens in a Grand Final is a recipe for intensity, but it began like a breeze for Wigan. First try, time, just three minutes gone. Flying out to the wings, Wigan scored two more tries in the first half to establish a 16-0 lead at one stage. St Helens grabbed one try back, just a straw in the wind. The second half was 13 minutes old when Sam Tompkins powered through to take Wigan to 20 points. This was St Helens' fourth final in succession. Now they were heading for their fourth consecutive defeat. Kieran Cunningham, who carries legendary status, could not carry the ball. His final Saints game was turning sour. A late try in the corner gave St Helens hope, but time was against them. 22-10 the final score. A 12-year wait for the big trophy has been an eternity by Wigan standards. The champions of the Super League. To beat St Helens to reclaim it, overwhelming. Joe Wilson, BBC News. To the football, there were seven games in the Premier League. Match of the day straight after the news, so if you don't want the results now, you know what you have to do. Manchester United still haven't won away from home in the league this season. They drew 0-0 at Sunderland. Sir Alex Ferguson said he was satisfied with the point as Sunderland had more chances to win the match. Elsewhere, Everton got their first win, 2-0 at Birmingham. Stoke beat Blackburn. Raphael van der Vaart scored twice as Spurs beat Aston Villa 2-1. West Brom Bolton and West Ham Fulham ended one all and Wigan beat Wolves 2-0. In Scotland, Celtic and Rangers both kept up their 100% record with wins against Hamilton and Hearts. There were also wins for Inverness, Dundee United, Motherwell and St Johnston. And that's all your sport. Riz. Thanks very much. And that's it. You can, of course, see more on the day's stories on the BBC News Channel. From us here, though, a very good night to you.